And tonight's speaker is local historian, businessman, and published author, Gordon Elston. And we'll be hearing from Gordon about his quest to find out more about the 14th century manor of Ham. Did you know there was one? It built 200 years before Ham House, and his quest to find out more and to raise public awareness of what was there once upon a time. This is the first time, I think, you have spoken to us? It is, yes. The first time. So we're very pleased to welcome Gordon and to hear his talk. Well, good evening, and thank you very much for joining me this evening to talk about, or to listen to the presentation on the Royal Medieval Manor House of Ham. If you look behind me, you see a building, a very forgettable building, which is located on Ham Street, directly opposite Greycourt School. Every day, hundreds of students, teachers, and visitors to the German bakery pass this building without probably even looking up. Um, well, at least they don't marvel at its fabulous construction or inspiring design. It is quite frankly unmemorable. I've used the quote there, and we'll come back to the end of the talk, because I think that sums this all up is so often when we're walking around our area uh, where we live, we look at things and we just ignore them. We don't inquire into actually what was there before, what was the story behind this place. But when you live in such a fertile area as Sheen, now Richmond, Ham, Petersham or Kingston, it is full of history because it was the place of kings and queens and a motley bunch of lords and knights and all sorts that came here because it was located close to kings and queens. So my journey started about eight, ten years ago, when I was actually researching the ancient history of Ham. Now what really surprised me is that when I visited the Richmond Local Studies collection just down the road, they had hardly any information on Ham before the Stuarts. And it tends to be that even with Richmond, the majority of the history is relating to the Tudors. So it was a great welcome surprise to me to travel further into Surrey to the Surrey History Centre in Woking, which actually yielded some very interesting information on Ham and Petersham. Because I discovered this. This is a very faded, fax document tucked away in the archives that recorded the demolition of a three-bay hall 15th century medieval manor house that was demolished in June 1958. Further investigation disclosed these pictures taken after or during the demolition or when it was well underway. It appears that the field archaeologist archaeologist was notified late by the builders and he only captured part of the demolition. But what was very useful is, is that he did make extensive notes and made sketches and these photographs were taken. But from this you can clearly see the, if you can see on here, these are the Gothic window frames of windows at the time, which for that period was quite exceptional. I then subsequently followed up with Richmond Council to inquire if they had any record whatsoever of a 15th century medieval manor. They had none. There was no history of it whatsoever. So all that history is on that single fax document in Surrey History Centre in Woking. Just to set a context so that you can see it here, the meander curve of the River Thames that you can see coming round. Ham House is located up here. This is Ham Street coming down. This is the location of Greycourt School. And this is where 
that block is that we saw in the first photograph. This will be Ham Common and Ham Common Woods. And this is the road that leads to Kingston and the road that leads via Petersham up to Richmond. This is an early, just trying to get it right, the 20th century, showing the layout of the farm that existed here. The almshouses are very important because they're actually still there. They're one of the structures that is still there. And the almshouses are here. And that's important for us because we're going to use that to anchor the later images that we have. Now, this was very interesting because it was by actually sitting down and talking to local residents, some of whom are in their 80s and 90s, who were actually there as children when the farm existed. And they were able to give me the actual breakdown of the different components of the farm. So this is Ham Street, this is where Greycourt School is now, and then this is the farmhouse looking into the courtyard, the cow sheds, the barn and the bullpen. And there was a dairy at the time. But, as I say, anchoring on the almshouses, we can now take a Google image and we can actually transpose the actual location of the farm so you can see exactly where it would have fitted today. So the German bakery is probably just about here. All right. Once more, Surrey History Centre provides useful information. We can see here how the farmhouse looked in 1870. This is one of the earliest photographs of Ham. Charlotte Hatch, who is the daughter of the tenant farmer, who is Hatch, is standing at the gate. Her fiancé, Edward Rain, of the Rain family, from which Rain's Park is named, is to her right. Now, at the beginning of the Second World War, the government commissioned artists to paint scenes of rural life in the countryside, and Ham was actually chosen for its pastoral setting. And many sketches were made by artists who came into both Ham and Petersham to sketch the actual environment. And again here, it's great because it can show the work behind Ham Street. We can see the cows going down Ham Street. This is the old Royal Oak pub. And this is the manor, the barn, that was actually located at the, the edge of the, the farm. Um, another pastoral setting that we have here. And then, now this is really important because about knowledge of this house, was it known at the time? Well, Surrey Antiquities in 1956, and that's two years before the actual building was, or the buildings were demolished, they sent, they commissioned a photographer to photograph these buildings of the actual farm, the farmhouse. So what we have here is we have, oh, we have looking into the courtyard, we have the dairy, we have the back of the house, and again looking down the side of the house to the dairy. Now, people really note the cars at the time, 1956, the wonderful cars that are here. So this is the back of the barn looking directly onto Greycourt School, what is now and then the actual farmyard itself. So it gives us a real sense of the actual scale of that farmhouse. And here we have, you have the dairy, and you can see there, Chibacolin tested, pasteurized, and Channel Islands milk. There were nearly 200 cows on this farm. The cow sheds, which were actually on Back Lane, now, 1956 was the year that Greycourt School was built, and therefore you had for a period of two years or so this very interesting mix of school children in a very large school di directly opposite a farm with many cows and a very irascible bull, by all accounts. And then coming back, the barn. We've already seen, we've seen the image here, 
of the, um, the drawing, the sketch. So this would be looking down through the barn, this wonderful barn that was there. But this is the key. These are the interesting pictures, because what we have is the interior of the farmhouse, and you can see where the fabric of the refurbished farmhouse has been built around the original medieval hall. We have the timber arches, and here we have the wooden Gothic windows, and further down we have a Tudor period dining room that would have been built sometime 100 years after the original house was built. So, no one really can say that they didn't know it existed. Surrey Antiquities had a record of it. It was very much firmly there. Right, what I want to do, because obviously we have people here from, I know, from Kingston. We have people from Richmond and Ham. I want to have a look, a brief overlook, at the medieval landscape, because I want to set the context of what we're talking about. So, if we come here, we have Sheen Palace, or Richmond Palace, which is just across here on the green. So that's Richmond Palace up here. We have chapels at Sheen and Petersham. We had originally, very early medieval period, we had a Saxon settlement in Ham by Teddington Lock. And coming down to Kingston, we had a grange, we had the Lovekin Chapel, we had the Clatton Bridge, which still exists, as does the Lovekin Chapel, and very importantly, the mother church of the area, which was the All Saints Church, which is located here. We also had a grange that I'll talk about in a minute, but very importantly, the thing that set Kingston apart and really built the local economy is we had a bridge in Kingston. And that was the only bridge other than Southwark Bridge, London Bridge, crossing the Thames. So it was actually a very, very important bridge. Now, I talk about Kingston. I know this is the Richmond Local History Society, so you're going to have to forgive me here, but at this time, Kingston, the hundred of Kingston from the Saxon times, extended from Chesington, within the red boundary here, all the way up to Kew and Sheen and what is now, what is later called Richmond. So we had East Sheen and West Sheen, that would originally have been called Sheen. So when I'm going to be talking, when I refer to Sheen, that is actually Richmond. So I make no excuses, we are actually, the talk is about the Kingston 100, because in the medieval landscape, that was the actual setting of the landscape. Right, we're going to do a quick whiz through. We're going to set the tone for the kings and queens during this medieval period and how it affected the local area and how it fitted in. We have Henry I, 1100 to 1135. As you can see there, it's, um, he was the youngest son of the conqueror. And it was, he, although he was the youngest son, he became king. He was present at the time of the accidental death of his elder brother, a hunting accident in the New Forest. So, you can read what you want into that, but he was actually a very successful king. He provided administration. Unfortunately, his heir, William, was tragically killed in the white ship when the white ship sunk off of France. But why is it important for us here because he, during his reign, they established Merton Abbey in the area. And Merton Abbey was the powerhouse. This was the seat of influence. The church in Kingston was held by Merton Priory. Merton Priory held the manor which was directly north of Kingston, so all the area of the Tudor estate was in an area called Cambry. Cambry derives directly because it was Canonbury, it was the place of the canons of Merton Priory. They also held land in Hatch, next to Ham, and they also held land in Hartingdon, and Hartingdon Manor was actually where Penn Ponds Car Park is now. So you know where the coffee shop, the little coffee kiosk is? That was the manor of Hartingdon. So that was part, and that was held by the canons 
of, of Merton Priory. Henry II. Henry II is very, very important to us. Um, unfortunately, he's gained notoriety because of the unfortunate incident with Beckett. And what was the, I think, what was it, the expression, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest, which set Beckett up to martyrdom, and unfortunately, um, Henry II had to pay penance and his reputation was tarnished thereafter. At the time, <coughs> we had a lord of the manor, a Norman knight, in Ham, and we can see here that Kingston and Ham were actually at that time quite important because when Henry's daughter Matilda married Henry the Lion, Kingston made a contribution to the wedding of 12 pounds and 10 shillings and Ham made the contribution of two pound, three shillings and fourpence. But Kingston, make no mistake about it, Kingston took off under Henry II during this period of time. If you can imagine a small town that was part originally of a Saxon estate, and that's all it was, on an island, suddenly during the reign of Henry, a stone church is built, All Saints Church. It is built out of stone. Then, in addition, at the same period of time, a bridge is built over the River Thames, connecting Middlesex to the Surrey Bank. Furthermore, we have the island of Kingston, because in Kingston was originally a gravel island. We have four bridges, three other bridges, that connect the north, the east and the south, one of which is still surviving, which is known as the Clatton Bridge, which you can see on the south side of Kingston, just out of the marketplace. So if you can just imagine all this construction taking place, this due in traders, in market people, Kingston was thriving, it was just taking off. And it was probably during that period of time that the the, the free men of Kingston, the very affluent traders, actually turned around and said, we don't need a sheriff. The sheriff is always involved between us and the king, taking his cut. What we want is we want to pay a fee farm, a rent, an annual rent, directly to the king. And the chances are it, is, it happened then under Henry II because obviously the trading people were emboldened by the fact that their town was now very prosperous. So Henry II, very, very important. We then come on, ah, oh, Richard the Lionheart. Now the thing about the Lionheart, it is popular myth that he was the great, the heroic, the, the crusader king. But what did he do for England? He was actually an absolute disaster. He bankrupt the kingdom. He didn't speak English, he hardly spent any time here at all. He spent the majority of the time either on crusade or fighting to retain his positions in Normandy. Um, he was there though, where he gained his reputation, he was at the Siege of Acre um, when the, the, the Saracens were defeated and then the Christians took hold. But as always happens, you had all the Christian knights there and there was a great falling out between the kings and the dukes of the various principalities and kingdoms of Europe. A massive falling out. And then in a fit of arrogance or anger, Richard held the banner of Austria down from the parapets above the Great Wall to the ground. Well, unforgivable. Problem is, Richard, then on his way back from the Crusades, he's shipwrecked. And he's seized, he's taken hostage, and he's handed over to the Austrians. The Austrians now have possession of Richard. And so they host him in the dungeons on this hotel, uh, hotel, on the Danube, this castle there, and they demand this huge ransom, which is probably equivalent to about four billion pounds today for the release of the king who was never in England. So you have this crazy situation where his mother, Eleanor, is desperately trying to raise the ransom money through the church, because obviously he was on crusade, 
But at the same time, his younger brother, John, has come to an agreement with the king of France, and they have made a separate bid of a reasonable price for the Austrians to actually keep Richard in captivity. So when you see the depiction of John, whether it be in Disney or anything, you know the making, the, the sort of person that John was. Any opportunity, but he was trying to break out from Richard, and he wanted Richard to stay incarcerated. Unfortunately for him, his mother raised the ransom, Richard was released, and the King of France sent John a message, and he simply said, look to yourself, the devil is loose. And with which, John left UK very smartly, or England very smartly, and went to hiding in France. So, the rain, you're talking about the actual value, it was probably at that time 25% of the GDP of the England at the time that the people had to pay to ransom their king. He came back, he was in England for maybe six months, uh, establishing his authority, and then he disappeared off to northern France where he was killed. John, we have John. At this point, I'm leaving the notes, by the way. I'm just <laughs> I'm going to go through this with you. John, he's, so he was a king. He was a conniving king. He was very cunning. The barons didn't trust him. England entered this terrible period of war. Why did it impact? The problem is, you know, we said that, that Kingston had this bridge, which was one for trade, but also a crossing point for army. What was then happening was this continuous battle for security of the bridge. And if they couldn't secure the bridge, they would attempt to destroy it. So what you had with John, previously under the reign of Richard, is you had John creating havoc with Welsh and Flemish mercenaries, raiding Kingston, destroying the fields and the settlements around it, and trying to destroy the bridge. And again, with the Baronial Wars, we had that problem. But the one thing is, the first official charter that we have in Kingston which shows that the people, the free men of Kingston, have the right to pay directly to the king, is actually recorded under John. John then goes on, he then signs the Magna Carta and promptly ignores it. He, it didn't matter, he signed it and ignored it, it didn't matter. And so the warring, the feuding continued. His son was, Henry III, was nine years old. When, he, when John died, he came to the crown. He was in a very difficult situation because the barons had invited the son of the king of France over with an army from France and they were causing havoc in the south of England, fighting against the king's men. But fortunately for young Henry, Sir William Marshall, the greatest knight, the known the legendary knight of all time, was there and he swore an oath to protect his king. He destroyed the French in the Battle of Lincoln, and then he, in a great naval battle, which is probably a forerunner of the Armada, they destroyed the French fleet that supplied all the logistics for the French army that was here. He then negotiated a peace settlement, and that peace settlement was actually established on an island in Kingston. Raven's A is the island that that peace treaty was actually on. Sorry, Gordon. Marshall, the great knight, um, who had unseated nearly 500 other knights in various tournaments, including the Richard the Lionheart when he was younger. He then died, and Henry followed basically the same rule as his father and fell out with the barons. Again, Kingston was besieged again and again because you had very famous, a very wealthy baron, Gilbert de Clare, who had land in Surrey, who was taking a seizing position of Kingston Bridge. So for the traders and the people of Kingston, it was an absolute, absolute nightmare because you had these mercenary armies sweeping through Kingston, a wealthy town, and it was like a magnet. It was being destroyed again and again. Henry's son, Edward I, the hammer of the Scots, 
1272 to 1307. He was a strong king. He reestablished the kingdom. Um, but again, he was very much involved in the crusade. But he had a very loyal knight, Sir Otto de Grandison, who was actually a page boy and grew up and studied alongside Edward. Now, Otto de Grandison was made lord of the manor of Sheen and Ham. This was his territory. And it was given to him because it was the, this was the best reward for the most fertile knights, was to give them, or not for the most fertile knights, for the most loyal knights, was to give them the fertile land. And the fertile land was here on, by the Thames, and this was awarded to successive knights. And also Bishop Burnell, who was the chancellor at that time and served as regent when Edward was actually on crusade. And Bishop Burnell, he would have been made Archbishop of Canterbury, um, the, the foremost position in the country, but the Pope objected because of the number of mistresses and illegitimate children that he had at the time. Um, but very importantly, coming back to Kingston here, his second marriage, Edward's second marriage to Margaret of France, was financed by a loan of nearly 500 pounds from Edward Lovekin of Kingston. He lent him the money, but then Edward then went up to Scotland, and on his way to Scotland in the wars up there, he died. He was taken, his, the reign was then taken by his son, Edward II. Edward II would have been a very, very popular king today. But at the time, Edward II, although a man of great stature, very strong, very handsome by all accounts, he wasn't interested in jousting. He wasn't interested in tournaments and knightly stuff. His greatest passion was mixing with the common people, digging ditches, thatching roofs, and swimming and fishing in the river. And he spoke, he was speaking the vernacular with the local people. He was known by all the fishermen between Kingston and Sheen because he would be inquiring about their catch, and on many occasions, he would be paying a very good price for their catch. So he was very much revered by the local people in this area. Problem is, this was a turbulent time because he was a passionate man, um, and he had affairs with men and women and... He was taken advantage of by two knights. Um, the first, Pierre de Gavascon, the second, Hugh de Spencer. And Hugh de Spencer was actually married to Edward's niece. But then the poor wife of Edward, Isabel, was actually now fearful that Edward was also having an affair with his niece. It was a very turbulent, it was a very complicated situation. You then had the revolt by Isabel, who had taken custody of the young Edward, who later became Edward III in France. They then returned to England with an army, and they besieged, and they, they chased uh, Dispenser and Edward to Wales, and they were seized there. Um, the death of um, apparently watched by Queen Isabel of Dispenser was something dreadful because he was hung, drawn and quartered. You can see the image here. Um, no mercy was actually given. His wife, Eleanor Dispenser, who was actually of the de Clare family, one moment she was in a mansion in Sheen being fated by Edward with goldfinches, looked after, and the next moment, she's in a cold, dingy cell in the tower. And she was held there because she was pregnant. And Isabel feared that she was pregnant with Edward's child. Anyway, Edward, according to popular the story legend, he was murdered with a red-hot poker up his backside. Now, that obviously, that story had public appeal, and therefore, it carried through the ages. As to whether it's authentic or not, there's historians who have another view on it, but it is the story that stuck.
But for the local people, it was a very sorry loss because he was a king of the people. But local presence, again, he would be paying money out for the ongoing maintenance repair of Kingston Bridge. And he now had a manor house actually in Sheen somewhere around here. Edward III, the great Edward, who established the Order of the Garter, he, um, he, when he came to power, he built the palace, the first royal palace at Sheen was built by Edward III. He was obviously involved in the great battles in France. We had Cressy, Poitiers, but he had the clerk of works, his number one builder was a chap called William de Wickham. And he was the Bishop of Winchester. Now the Bishop of Winchester had a hall in Kingston called the Bishop's Hall, which was right next to All Saints Church, but actually facing onto the river. For those of you who know Kingston well, there is a pub there called the Bishop, which was originally the Bishop out of residence because the Bishop wasn't often in his hall because he, was, he had another palace at Southwark. He had his palace at Winchester, so he was traveling through. But the Bishop pub, next time you go past on the river, is named after the William de Wickham's uh, hall there. And there is actually a plaque, if you look up, this is the Bishop Pub, there is a plaque to William de Wickham. He had a great saying, man as maketh man. This was a period that although in a sort of historic warfare terms, medieval warfare, he was a great king, a great knight, this was a dreadful time for the people of England because during this time we had a dreadful famine followed by the plague that just killed so many people followed by civil disorder. Law and order literally break down. So Isabel, Queen Isabella, Edward III's mother, who has now moved into the mansion um, in actually Sheen, so the king is in the palace, she's got the mansion house. Her mansion house was destroyed by vagabonds and robbers, as were many of the residences in Kingston at the time. The manor of Hurtingdon that we mentioned was destroyed and looted by those vagabonds who were roaming the countryside. Ah, very important, Chaucer. He was a squire in the court. And he was actually captured by the French, and the king actually, thanks to the king, he paid the ransom of 16 pounds to release Geoffrey Chaucer for him to come back to the royal court. So therefore, his history could then continue. The legend has it, well not the legend, the fact is, towards the end of his life, Edward then had a mistress, Alice Pereres, the notorious Alice. But they would say that, wouldn't they? The fact is, she had great influence over the king and the barons didn't like the fact that the woman had this influence. So she has been described as on his deathbed, he died in Sheen in the palace, which would just be down here by the river, that she was removing all the gold and ruby rings from his fingers and seizing his property. But again, he dies, but they have had three children together. They've had one son and two daughters. And what's very interesting is, is that the second daughter, Joanna, she married a local Kingston lawyer, Robert Skern. And there is a tomb in All Saints Church in Kingston, which has long since disappeared, but they are buried under the floor in All Saints Church. But what you can see is if you go to All Saints Church, is, you know the little coffee shop? For those who've been there, there's a coffee shop, and you look down the nave. On the right-hand side here is a brass. And on the left is... Joanna, and on the right is Robert, dating from the 14th century. And you can actually touch it and trace the image of Joanna. So Joanna is the daughter of Edward III of England, the great medieval king. She is therefore the half-sister of the Black Prince. She is also the half-sister of John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, and the Duke of York, which is where it all began with the War of the Roses. Edward dies, 
His son, who was the great warrior, the Black Prince, unfortunately dies a year before Edward. So therefore, the crown passes to his 19-year-old son, Richard. Richard, again, is not interested in jousting. He's a man who indulges in fashion. At the age of 15, he is married to Anne of Bohemia, who comes over, and they now move into Sheen Palace. So if you can imagine, this must be the year before their GCSEs, they're married. They have, they're living in this pavilion, this paradise pavilion on the Thames opposite the palace. And she's introduced all these strange fashions from Bohemia. One of which is these weird shoes where the fronts, the cloth shoes that come up and they had to tie them to their shins to stop tripping over the shoes. So whenever you hear the term Bohemian, it comes from Anne of Bohemia who introduced these fashions. So although it was an arranged marriage, he was absolutely infatuated with Anne of Bohemia. And it was like a, a Romeo and Juliet, it's a love story, because then tragedy happened. Suddenly she dies, whether it was a plague or whether influenza, that something that happened at the time, she's, she's dead. And he was absolutely devastated, so he ordered that the palace of Sheen be destroyed, that it be demolished, because he couldn't bear to visit anywhere where he had had such happy memories with his wife Anne. But during his reign, the latter part, Chaucer becomes the clerk of works based in Sheen. The clerk of works is the foremost builder of the time. He's responsible for the maintenance and refurbishment a new building of all the royal castles, manor houses, palaces in the kingdom. Chaucer held that post here in Sheen. But, very importantly, Bishop's Hall, William de Wickham has lent it out to a master carpenter, Hugh Herland, who is the number one carpenter in the land. And for those of you, well, we all saw it, the queen lying in state, her body lying in state, in Westminster Hall, the man who built that tremendous roof was Hugh Holland, the master carpenter who had his residence in Kingston and Bishop's Hall next to All Saints Church. Richard doesn't cut it. His cousin, who is a warrior, who does all the tournaments, Henry Bolingbroke, he does. And he looks on Richard, he looks on the chaos of the reign, he usurps the throne. The House of Lancaster is established. Richard is then supposedly, he dies in a castle in Wales, probably starved to death. He disappears. The House of Lancaster has now begun. But the problem is, when you usurp a king, the rightful king, what is the saying? Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. But it's very important because the War of the Roses has now kicked into the gear. The House of Lancaster has established its position, but for a lot of people, unfairly. And there were a number of revolts, one of which took place and planned in Kingston, the Epiphany Rising, planning the murder of Henry and his sons. His son takes over Henry V, great warrior. Uh, in 1415, in, I just, get the time, May 1415, he purchases um, the manor of Petersham from um, Chertsey, uh, it comes to an arrangement. In June, he purchases the manor of Ham from Burnell for 200 pounds, and in October, he fights the Battle of Agincourt. We see here the Black Prince's ruby that featured in the, in the helmet of Henry during that battle. Now Henry, at the age of 16, GCSE year, he knew the efficacy of the longbow and the arrow. Because at the age of 16, at the Battle of Shrewsbury, a longbow arrow had come through his right cheek and buried itself six inches into his skull. It took the royal surgeon, he had to devise a special tool to drill out the arrowhead from his face. So you can imagine the pain and the trauma that he experienced, but that's when he literally came face to face to terms with how effective the longbow and the arrow was. 
But you never ever see any image of Henry V on the right side of his face because that would have been very badly scarred. 1422, right towards the last year of his reign, he establishes John Ardern as the clerk of works, uh, the foremost builder. John Ardern holds this position for 22 years through the early years of the life of Henry VI, the young, the infant son of Henry V. But John Ardern is also awarded with the farm of Sheen, Petersham and Ham, the rents from it. So when we then come on to the medieval manor house of Ham, who built it? My belief is the most likely person is the foremost builder in the country who had access to all the building materials because Henry V has rebuilt Sheen Palace as well because he needed legitimacy for the House of Lancaster, so he built the palace on the site of the palace of Edward III, so it would have just been here. John Ardern is involved in that construction and also a couple of monasteries. He is the person that had the means of building the Manor House of Ham, and because he owed the rents to the farms, therefore he had an incentive to do that. His son took over the crown at the age of nine months, married Margaret of Anjou. He loved coming to Sheen to hunt in the park. Now, a lot of people think it was Richmond Park. Richmond Park didn't exist then. That was just, that was actually fertile land, uh, a lot of which had been laid to waste after the, um, the plague because it wasn't fertile as the river valley land, um, well, obviously right next to the river. So, when we talk about hunting at this period of time, all the hunting is done in Old Deer Park. That is where the hunting was actually carried out. You then have the War of the Roses in its ascendancy. It's kicking off the House of York, the House of Lancaster. Richard of York is fighting back. Edward IV takes power. Um, Henry VI, he's imprisoned, but he's not killed, which was a big mistake that Edward made. The thing is, if you seize, if you usurp the crown, you have to make sure that the king, who has been deposed, is dead. Otherwise, he is the source of the next rebellion against you. He didn't make the mistake a second time because despite a revolt by the kingmaker, the Earl of Warwick, in which Edward was deposed and he disappeared to France for a year, he returned, he won the war, he was now back in charge, that night in the Tower of London, Henry VI was smothered to death. And then, very publicly at night, the royal barge travelled all the way down the river from the tower to Chertsey Abbey. Fully lit up, illuminated, travelling very slowly so all the rev residents of the towns by the river bank could see that the king was dead. Long live the king. Richard III... He then, unfortunately, Edward IV, although he brought stability, uh, administration, competence, he dies relatively young. He hands over, or technically he should have handed over to his son, Edward V, who is a juvenile. But Richard III looks after, takes custody of the two young princes, or the young king and the prince. They disappear into the tower, never to be seen again. Richard III becomes king. So you have this thing, is, is this the uh, family loyalty? Well, it's okay until it's all a matter of becoming king or not. Meanwhile, lurking in the shadows here, we have Henry Tudor and another Robert Skern, who's a descendant of the previous Robert Skern of Kingston. We have the Battle of Bosworth. Robert Skern, because he, of Kingston, because he is an active supporter, a very law supporter of Henry Tudor, he's banished, exiled to France by Richard. He goes over to France. He then returns with the invading army. The Battle of Bosworth is won. It is secured. Henry Tudor becomes the King of England. Robert Skern is rewarded. You can't... I don't know whether you can read this, but he's very handsomely rewarded, and he's awarded 
the farm or the title of, uh, I'm just trying to see it here, uh, favour, the offices of the keeper, the manor and garden of Sheen and New Park. And therefore, all the rents and wages out of the issues from Sheen, Petersham, Kew and Ham and the Isle of Crowd. So Robert Skirn of Kingston is very well rewarded by his king. Unfortunately, he either dies of wounds incurred at the Battle of Bosworth or he dies of the sweating sickness that was sweeping through London at the time. Robert Skirn dies before he can take advantage of this. But Henry is very, very smart. He has gained his line from the House of Lancaster through his mother, Margaret Beaufort. Tudor is a red herring. Tudor comes from lowly Welsh knights out in the borders. His, gain, his claim of legitimacy to the crown is all the way through, back through his mother to the mistress, Catherine Swinford, of John of Gaunt that came through. So that's how he claims it. But he now has a warring kingdom. He's very shrewd because what he does, he marries the daughter of uh, Edward IV, Elizabeth of York, who is the daughter of the White Queen. So he unites the House of York and the House of Lancaster and they're brought together. So therefore, the Tudor Rose is the White Rose of York and the, the, and the Red Rose of Lancaster united together. And he, they've united the kingdom. That is the beginning of the Tudor dynasty as we know it. She is, Elizabeth of York is the mother of the Tudors. Then Sheen Palace, which they have moved into here. Unfortunately, one Christmas is burnt down. It's destroyed. Therefore, no problem, he's going to rebuild it. He's going to build a new palace. He rebuilds that palace. He builds the palace and he calls it Richmond because he had the title before he became king of the Earl of Richmond in Yorkshire. So Richmond Palace is named after that. Then over a period of time, the surrounding area became known as Richmond. So Richmond here is, it derives from the Richmond in Yorkshire. This was a great find. When you're doing research like this, you're digging away. You're re I'm reading loads and loads of books. Primary material is a real challenge for me because I'm struggling to, my grasp of medieval Latin isn't that good. And actually, unrolling some of these huge calendar patent rolls in the archives is very, very difficult. Thanks to Alison Weir, the historian, she put me onto this because in one of her books about Elizabeth of York, there is this account. And she gave a source reference because she said in there is that Elizabeth of York kept her stables at Ham, which would be at the medieval manor house. So I went to the primary material and I found this, that in her expenses, uh, the privy expenses, there is items for shoeing of horses and the casting of a dunghill at the Queen's stable at Ham. So now we have the official record that the medieval manor was used by Elizabeth of York, the mother of Henry VIII, the grandmother of Elizabeth I, the great-great-grandmother of James I of England, James VI of Scotland. She had her stable in the house that we're talking about, opposite Grey Court School, that horrible building that we're looking at. So we're going to build up to this a little later, that when you next walk past that, you're going to look at that building very differently. And what I'm doing here, why is she so important? Why is this so important? Because... They have united, the two of them have united the House of York, the House of Lancaster. Now, the Tudors were actually a dead loss because you had Henry, you had all these children, but they all died without children. They drew a blank. So when you're talking about the reign perpetuating, the Tudor dynasty dies out here, except for the second daughter, Margaret Tudor, or the first daughter, the second child, Margaret Tudor, who marries the, uh, James IV of Scotland. Their son is James V, 
whose daughter is Mary, Queen of Scots, whose son is James VI. So actually, the Tudor line continues descending through. So when James comes and takes over from Elizabeth, he now creates the Stuart line coming through. So Elizabeth of York is there at the top of all of this, and then you have the descent all the way down to Charles III now, descended directly from that. Right, I'm just going to move quickly on the next bit because hopefully you've got the background, you've got the medieval landscape, and you see how important this stretch of land from Kingston to Sheen is now for trade, the prosperity, the kings and the queens, the playground. 1992, dreadful fire at Windsor. And why that is relevant is because Giles Downs was the architect who specialised in medieval architecture and a specialist woodworker. He was awarded the commission to rebuild St George's Hall, the Hall of the Order of the Garter. Very, very important. He didn't copy the original, he made it better. So he used all the skill, the craftsmanship of the people of current day, and he made this magnificent hall that you can go and see now, thanks to Giles Downs. Um, his image is actually within one of the ceilings. The medieval, the green man, this is the image of Giles Downs. So he's there in Windsor permanently. But his woodwork and the feathering that is coming out is absolutely immaculate. Why is this important? Because the last book that I wrote was The People of the Latchmere. The lady who wrote the foreword to that, and it's all about who you know, she is the principal, was the principal of Imperial College. Her brother is Giles Downs. So, while I was talking about all this research I'm doing, I asked her if she would hand to her brother all the demolition documents and drawings for him to take a look at. And he did. And alongside his assistant, Dr. Himnish Daz, who worked alongside him on the Windsor, they looked at those drawings and they looked at the windows um, and they mentioned the elaborate Gothic head windows. These special features at the Ham Manor suggest this was not an ordinary medieval house, but a special one, a manor house for the royal household estate. There it was. We now have that grave phase document in Surrey History Center, it is now coming alive. So the next step, can you do the drawings? So I commissioned Dr. Himmelish Daz, we, we need this to be brought alive. Can you do the drawings for me of what this looked like? So he has, there we have the ground floor plan, and we have, we're looking, as you can see, north, oh, come back a bit. We have north here, so we're looking on to what is, remember the courtyard of the farm? We have the solar, we have the service room, and the open hall in the middle. We're then looking from outside, the west elevation, we have the traditional medieval grill windows from that period. We have, on the north side, looking onto the courtyard, we have traditional grill windows, but most importantly of all, on the south side, we have these Gothic glass windows that are built in. So therefore, it's the windows that orientated the farmhouse because they were designed to capture the maximum amount of light all day to light up the interior hall. And at that time, this would have been a grand design. It was a royal medieval manor house. It was a grand design. And looking the south through the windows from the interior, you can see what a magnificent building it was that was unfortunately demolished. I've just there, from the 1841 tithe map, it gives you a quick impression of the, the landscape or the farm land at the time. We're looking at here, the ham farm is here. So this was all the furlongs, all the shots that were supporting this. Then the disappointment. So, real disappointment, because we have this development that has just come in, Ham Close development. We have on the corner plots, 
of this development, but isn't going to be demolished at this stage, is the buildings that I have shown you, the bakery, the shops and the apartments. But over here is the Ham Close development. And it is the destruction of all the original 1960s blocks and then the rebuild with probably double, triple the density of people going in there. But uh, they say, the, the people who designed it, working in close consultation with current residents of Ham, getting principal stakeholders, taking into account the history. They didn't listen to the history. They weren't interested. I went to them again and again with this history. And although they referred to it, they never took any account of the medieval manor house. They actually took their design inspiration from Ham House on the crucial building, which is this one here, which is going to be a community centre that backs directly onto what was the original manor house here. So, uh, a bit of despair there. So, it not only backs onto it, it is three storeys high, and it has only one window. This is white concrete blocks that will be directly overlooking the stable block of Elizabeth of York. It is what it is. Um, we move on. The Ham and Petersham Association, who represent the local residents, were furious about it. They were really upset. And as you can see, when they're talking about the design, it comes back to the indifferent design of the buildings, breaks the neighbourhood plan, no positive benefits in terms of townscape, local aesthetic quality, and relate to local context, local history. It's a done deal. It's been done. Um, and this is the ironic thing. Even the planning committee acknowledged the unme unmemorable nature of the design. So here we go again. We're repeating the cycle. We're back into a very historic landscape with all this rich legacy and we have more design. So I'm going to come to an end here. I'm just closing down. I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit late. But this, what, why I'm raising this now is with all of you here, is because this hasn't been demolished. This isn't in this phase. But the point is, this plot of land, those forgettable flats, those forgettable shops, opposite Grace Court School will in the next 10, 15 years be demolished. But then we need, we need a wave of knowledge and public awareness such that they do not put up another forgettable building block on the site of the medieval manor, the royal medi medieval manor house of Ham. That's what it would have looked like. That would have been the farmyard looking across. That would have been the north side the stable block where Elizabeth of York, she kept her horses, would have been here. This would have been the barn. Final slide, we then come in. Now, we elevate it. So next time you walk past here, you won't just see this very forgettable block of flats and apartments. You will actually be looking at a royal medieval manor house. And it's our job to resurrect this and my next project is to hopefully be working with the school, which is opposite, to put on a production to build up the themes, because talks are very good, but you, you have come here because you're interested in history. If you're going to get students and the people in the area involved, you need to make it horrible histories. The medieval period is, is just perfect for medieval magnificence, mayhem, murder, it's all going on. So my objective now is to turn this history into some sort of production where we ham it up and we make it memorable because then we create a resonance of this environment, of this landscape, which was absolutely fabulous. So I apologise for running over slightly, but I present to you the Royal Medieval Manor House of Ham and probably a better appreciation of your local area. There you go. <clears throat> Good evening. Can I thank, first of all, Shirley for a wonderful introduction, but also um, Gordon for an amazing tour de force, the whole of English history. <laughs> wonderful. I'm sure there are questions. Can I have a question, please? Uh, Adam has a, has a microphone, and we'll uh, find you. We went over there. 
Good evening, Gordon, a tour de force, and thank you so much. But what I really loved was the time and effort you took in recreating the buildings, the three-dimensional drawings, and your second last slide really brought it to life. Um, it's also quite interesting to know that contemporary architecture at the moment is reflecting on timber frame building construction. Um, it's very much the way in which architects are looking at uh, lowering the, um, the, the, the use of carbon with steel and concrete. So who knows? I think uh, it, it might not be a, a pipe dream to see timber frame buildings in Ham. So well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. My understanding is there was another manor house opposite where the Dysart pub is, and which is now on a, a children's recreation ground. What is the history of that? And, and it was under the Cole family. The Cole family are buried in, in, by the altar in Petersham Church. How do they fit into this picture of, of pre-Ham house manors? It's not an area of my expertise because I think that's coming into the Stuart period, which was a little bit later. But it wasn't just a house there, it was a grandiose palace that was located there with cascading gardens that came all the way down from Pembroke Lodge. And if you see some of the pictures of that, it was an absolutely magnificent building. And then that was burnt down, and then Gregory Cole, who's buried in um, St. Peter's Church, he was the lord of the manor at the time of Petersham. He then took that. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but that is very much of the Stuart period, which is obviously after this period. But it is, it's, it's notable in the sense of that was another magnificent design, um, a wonderful building, full of treasures as well. And apparently the, the book collection that was in that building, and unfortunately burnt, was incredible. I'm afraid it's Kingston, uh, but the Lovekin Chapel, you didn't say much about that. I keep going past it in the bu on the bus. Okay. And I don't know where it came from. I know it's very, very old, the oldest building in Kingston. Thank you. That's all I know. Thank you for raising that because, yeah, because I came off of my notes. <laughs> what happened is Edward Lovekin, he lent the 500 pounds to Edward I. Edward I never repaid the money. So there was this outstanding debt. Well, Edward Lovekin died. So when Edward II took power, they then came to a deal, uh, the Lovekin family came to a deal with Edward II and said, okay, we'll forget the 500 pound, but can you give us permission to build a Chantry Chapel so that we can have prayers said for our ancestors? And they agreed, and that was the beginning of the Lovekin Chapel. So it was dedicated to the memory of the Lovekins under the reign of Edward II to pay off the debt incurred for the marriage of Edward I. That is the history of it. So thank you for reminding me I missed that bit out. <laughs> it is, it's still there. It's just wonderful. But the, the thing is, it's getting that knowledge. So these great personalities, you've got the Lovekins and you've got the Skerns, two great Kingston families who played a very prominent part as you can see, in the royal households and the shaping of, of those households. Can you tell us what your best guess is for the heyday of the building that you have described there? So between what dates would that have been similar to what you've projected there? I would, the heyday, would, I would, I'd like to imagine. So obviously, it would have been very, very important. John Ardern, the, the principal builder, I would imagine that he built this. This is the place where he lived. This is the place where he could entertain royalty. This is where he could settle his design and construction of Sheen Palace. He could bring it out. But I also like to think that Elizabeth Woodville, the White Queen, the mother of Elizabeth York, she was the Lord of the Manor of Ham. She was granted that title. I like to think that she went riding there as well. And in fact, she introduced her daughter to the ham stables and the manor house, and they probably went riding together. And then maybe Elizabeth of York did the same with her daughter, Margaret Tudor. So we have that connection. We don't know for certain, but we can fill in the rest in our imagination, say, 
It was there. It was a royal stable that was there. We know Elizabeth of York. The chances are her mother was there and also her daughter was there. So these three people who were shaping English history, so important, were there. So that's all part of what I would say is the heyday. Yeah? But right at the beginning of the Tudor dynasty, this, these were the people that shaped it. Margaret Tudor, who would have been riding as a girl, who then connected that Tudor line through the Scottish kings all the way down. Is that? Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask you about clarification of the ownership of the farm at its end days in 1956? Um, there was scope for listing then. Uh, they've been around since 1947. Was there any sort of kind of reaction to the loss of this? Was any, any of the locals recognised the historic interest of that particular building? Were there any efforts to get it um, listed or a, a building preservation notice on it? Uh, and and um, was there any kind of debate about its, its future? And who was the owner at the time? And uh, who was the developer? It would have, at the time, it would have been part of the Dysart estate. It was then sold off. The local reaction was great sorrow that the barn and the actual farmyard had actually been sold off. But from a, I, I see no account that there was any local petition because, to tell the truth, the local people didn't know about the historical context, which was well hidden within the fabric of the building. Those, the people in Surrey Antiquities knew it. The council, I would presume, would have known it. The fact that a field archaeologist was sent along to record it, even though it was slightly late, at least enables us to recreate it but it was all part of the big sell-off at Ham under the Dysart estate at the time. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring it back into the public consciousness now. Any more questions? Any more comments? If not, I'm going to thank Adam for doing that. And I've got a little task here, which is to um, find a thank you present for Gordon <laughs> or something. Well, thank you. And and I hope, you, hope you're, going to, you're, going to, you're, you're, you're going to come again because it's a, a very long time to have to wait to have your first. I talk know, here. I know. Well, thank you so much for that. And I, I always come to, I come to these presentations with notes, and I think, oh, forget it, and I just walk off because I then think it's far better for you and it's far more interesting for me. And then I'm ad libbing and I'm working on the basis of having remembered it all, but I hate the notes because. The notes limit me and they, they stop the natural flow. So hopefully you felt that the moment I broke away from the notes and the rest of it, it actually starts bringing the whole history of the medieval kings and queens who were here. That's the point. This isn't some history book of some remote place. It was here. It all, all happened here. So tonight, just imagine Edward II there, out there with the fishermen, fishing there, swimming in the river, building ditches, and all his parents turning around and saying, what is he doing? And that's what I want you to remember, is the comedy in that and the human element of it all, which is so important. So, yeah, thank you very much. A great audience. <laughs>